Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Cree. Uh, I'm with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN. Uh, we are a nonprofit based out of the United States, working on localizing the SDGs around the world uh, through a network of leaders and universities. Um, so one of our flagship initiatives is the SDG Academy. Um, so we are here today as part of their Meet Our Leaders series. Um, this is a live Q&A session uh, where we're going to bring one of the leading figureheads in sustainable development to answer some questions. So if you're online with us now, please feel free uh, to type in your questions at any point and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, so without further ado, uh, I am excited to introduce everyone to Julia Martin Lefebvre. Uh, Julia has just completed a year as the Edward P. Bass Distinguished Visiting Environmental Scholar at Yale University. Uh, she will continue at Yale as an Executive Fellow at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and as a fellow at the Davenport College and a member of the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative and the Yale, Bio, uh, Yale Institute of Biospheric Studies. Um, so Julia has just stepped down as the director of the IUCN in January 2015. Uh, that was after eight years as the head of the world's largest international conservation membership organization. Uh, prior positions included the rector of the UN mandated uh, University for Peace, the executive, executive director of the LEAD uh, International, and the executive director of International Council for Science. Uh, she's also been on several panels, uh, co authored many novels and books, um, written many articles and op eds and has many awards, but I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna take up all our time with her great achievements, but everybody's welcome to go check out her Wikipedia page for more details. Um, so I'll end here just with saying she was born in Hungary, uh, educated in the United States and in France, and having lived in several continents, she considers herself a global citizen. So welcome, mm -hmm. Julia. Thank you. Um, so we did get a few questions beforehand, so I'm going to just start with one. Um, so as the former director of uh, the IUCN, what are some of the recent trends you see in nature conservation, uh, natural resource management, and su sustainable development that excite you the most? Okay, very good. Well, I have to remind you that IUCN was actually at the forefront of defining sustainable development in its study that was published six years before the Brundtland Commission, which actually used the same definition. So in a way, IUCN, which is seen as the conservation organizations, the red list of threatened species, is so well known. But IUCN has been interested in sustainability uh, before it became a mainstream interest, or at least I hope it's a mainstream interest. And I think that the Biggest, so the, the name of that publication in 1981, if anybody is interested to look at it, is called the World Conservation Strategy, Living Resource Conservation for Sustainable Development. So what excites me the most, I think, is that the conservation community, and IUCN is one of the biggest, 1,600 members, governments and NGOs, and thousands of, of, of passionate people, but I think that Finally, in the last 10 years, I would say that the conservation community has seen its role as not only loving the species that those great scientists love, but also that nature must contribute to the well-being of our planet and all of its inhabitants. And, you know, we human beings are a part of nature. So I think that's, for me, the most exciting. And there are lots of activities around that. Can, is that it? Yep, I saw you. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. So, yeah, so nowadays we see really this role of global networks growing, and the IUCN is obviously one of the more well known ones. Um, mm -hmm. So, how do you see this, you know, with the interconnectedness of different sectors and scales, the role of networks playing um, in sustainable development? Thanks, Elena. I, mean, I love that question because I think networks are really, really important because what they do is connect 
people connect thinking, connect different schools of thought, connect different cultures. But I have to say that while, while, while we talk an awful lot about the need for this interconnectivity or integration, as we call it, our systems are still not set up to be very friendly to the, that kind of thinking. Uh, I've always had to explain, you know, what it is that I do and why I do it. Networks. There's, there's not a PhD in networks. There's not a Nobel Prize for anybody working on interdisciplinary things. Uh, universities are basically set up around disciplines. Uh, uh, government departments are in silos. And not to mention the intergovernmental system, which very rightly so has been pushing for the sustainable development goals. But it, it in itself is also in different different pockets and people don't always talk to each other as much as we, those of us who live and breathe networks think that they should. So it's a little bit of a problem, but, um, but there, there are good, there, there are steps to show that progress is being made. I think um, there is in the, in the world, in the field of health, for example, with population health and environment, those approaches are pushing those disciplines together much more. And I think one of the, most encouraging bits of news recently is that the International Council for Science, which I used to be the director of, it's a very, very important non-governmental organization founded in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, uh, focusing on natural, the natural sciences or the hard sciences, and the International Social Science Council focusing on human behavior are finally seriously talking about merging. That is really great news. That will help in integration. I wish we could have done that when I was in charge of ICSU, but I, this is very good news. So there are, there are steps along the way, but if I were leading the world, I would, I think, try to break down all those walls between disciplines, starting in kindergarten, so that people can really live and breathe integration. That, that's very helpful. So for those practitioners maybe that are well past kindergarten um, and already <laughs> working in their fields, do you have any um, suggestions on how they should promote these integrated approaches, maybe in their own institution or among institutions? Well, certainly the students that I've been working with at Yale are really pushing for that. And the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies is uh, does provide an an inter interdisciplinary education at the master's and PhD level. Uh, uh, and then the, the, the biggest challenge is for people to find really good jobs if they don't wish to go into academia, for example. But what I would love to see is people with interdisciplinary background, interdisciplinary studies, to be, to be found in places of leadership all over the world, in academia and in non-governmental and governmental positions, so that this idea of having studied and inter, having had an interdisciplinary way of looking at the world's challenges is more and more respected and more and more common. I have to say that when I got my first serious job at the inter, International Council for Science, the then president of the organization, a very distinguished Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, really didn't quite understand the environmental studies that I had done. And nevertheless, he he took a chance on me and really it was under our leadership that we started a lot of the interdisciplinary programs. Yeah, uh, it's funny here at SDSN, we work with a lot of different organizations as well. And we always are trying to do that integrated approach or these integrated events. And even mm -hmm. just in the planning, the way people think in these different, you know, academic yeah. silos, it's very unique, you know, a scientist and a politician speaking together. Yeah can just be the different language. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you have to remember, you know, in, in today's world, and certainly in yesterday's world, a scientist is recognized by the number of publications in journals of their, of their specialty. And frankly speaking, very few people outside of that specialty have access to or even wish to read those journals because the language is kind of complicated and so on. So the recognition right now, as I said, nobody gives a Nobel Prize for interdisciplinary work. So recognition by society and by awards is not yet really made to those people who are working on the kinds of things that SDSN is working on. And that, that will change, I'm sure of that, 
but it's so. Yes, time, right? It takes time. Um, yeah, so we and we don't have so much time. That's the problem, I think. It is. 2030 is quickly approaching. Right. Uh, so we had one question come in um, just now that you've stepped down from the IUCN um, and you're at Yale. Could you speak more to what you're doing these days and what your future holds? Okay. So first of all, I'm not at Yale full time. I had this really wonderful fellowship, as you said, the Edward P. Bass Distinguished Visiting Scholar, Environmental Scholar. And I was told I could do whatever I wanted to. And I carved out an extremely interesting year for myself. I probably could have just sat behind a closed door and written or thought or maybe even slept for a year. I mean, it was very generous, a recognition, I suppose, of an active public life. But that there was no reason for me to be in New Haven except to get very involved in the life of the students. So I did, um, I did start to write, and I'm almost done now, with a, a book about my professional journey and the lessons learned and what I learned and what were the, the real things that happened that people don't yet write about. I, I think we always imagine that an organization, if it has great objectives like the SDSN or like IUCN or ICSU or the United Nations, that that's that's great then it must be great but it really does depend so much on the human beings on leadership uh, uh, and so I talk uh, quite a lot in my my memoirs or my the, the description of my journey about how how decisions were made and and uh, so I did that but I also got very very much involved in the life of the students a number of students were interested in looking at the UN system to see if it, there could be solutions, we used the word solutions there, to refresh the UN system to be an institution for the 21st century. And uh, so we ran a seminar about that the whole year and this, we're, we're, we're continuing to work on those issues. Then I did co-teach two courses. One was about international organizations and it happened to be about uh, the IUCN World Conservation Congress, to which Yale students, many Yale students, attended. And um, of course, frankly, I knew a lot more about that than any of the distinguished professors at Yale, so they were happy to have me there. And there was a big Yale delegation of students that attended and was very, very productive. And then I also co-taught a course on the sustainable development uh, goals, and which I'm continuing to be involved in and will continue uh, uh, next semester. And finally, and probably the most important thing that I did, in my view, is that I connected with a lot of the students. Once they discovered that someone like me was on campus, someone who they what they call professor of practice, someone who's been out in the big world, they really came to me and, and ate into my time, but I accepted that with pleasure. I'm still in touch with many of them. They wanted to talk about how best to go about influencing policy. And I, I, in fact, I've written lots of letters of recommendation. Quite a few of the students, the ones who graduated, have gotten good jobs, not because of me, but because of their talents. But perhaps it helped them to talk about it with someone like me. It is Yale is, while it's in the United States, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies has a lot of foreign students, so who wanted to play a global role. So that's it. Um, it's a complicated response, but I, I continue to be linked to Yale. I was very honored to be asked to stay on as this executive fellow, uh, and 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 I have committed to go back twice a year for for each time for as much, as long as I can in in the autumn and in the spring semester to continue to work with them on the SDGs. That's great. Uh, obviously, working with students and like this next generation of thought leaders and really inspiring them to do more than we've done in the past is very important. And I know Jeff often works towards that and spends a lot of time with his students. So I'm really glad that they now have you as a resource. Yeah, it's it's really it's really the most satisfying part of my life. This summer, for example, I had two students here for quite a long time. Uh, one of them focusing on influencing science policy internationally, and of course, I could open doors for her. In fact, she, she met somebody from SDSN and had an interview and this will be a great paper, I'm sure. Fantastic. We look forward to it. Um, so I guess keep, keeping on this track of discussing students and, you know, this next mm -hmm. generation of leaders, um, what, re what qualities do you think these days really make a good leader, a 21st century leader? 
Okay, yeah, I think I, I, I'm glad that you asked that question because I, I guess I mentioned the word leadership a couple of times. I think it's really important. It's probably the biggest missing thing in our in our world. And you'd wonder why seven and a half billion people, why are there not more leaders? But, but it's amazing to think, in fact, that there is no formal and required training in leadership skills at any level of our education system anywhere. There are some leadership courses, but only very few people can take them. So I think um, there are a couple of characteristics. I think good leadership uh, should, in my view, uh, our good leaders should be great and obviously honest communicators. In other words, they must be able to get their messages out in such a way that they're understood by all citizens. I guess I, I referred a little bit earlier to those scientific journals, which are really great and for, for which scientists are recognized. But I always used to tell my students at Yale and in other places, at least become bilingual. In other words, if you really need to use the technical terms of your field, I'm not sure that that's necessary, but if you really need to use it, though, explain your science in those specific terms, also learn how to explain it to someone else who's out of your field. So I think that's very important. Um, and this c communication challenge, of course, is really not only faced by, by leaders, but everyone. So I think leadership, clear communications is important. Um, and of course, um, uh, I don't only mean talking to others, but I mean talking with and listening to others is equally important. Uh, other leadership skills that I think are important is in, include system thinking, the ability to understand all of the angles of the complex problems uh, that we are facing today, and the ability to look at the big picture and to think and plan for the long term. Our society is based on silos, as we said, but also short-term uh, am ambitions and promises. So, for example, leaders promises cannot always be made for a specific term of their term as a, as a mayor of a city or as a president of a country. And if we're really serious about thinking about future generations, which is what sustainability is all about, we need to be able to make plans and stick to them that will probably be realized beyond our lifetime. So, and that's, you know, no nobody running for a leadership office is making promises for something that will bear fruit 50 years from now. And, and I'm afraid that that's, um, that's gonna be important. So, so I think system thinking and the long-term thinking is, is very important. And then of course, in an increasingly globalized world, another leadership skill of great importance is the ability to understand other cultures. And that's not everybody, not every country is very good at that. So for example, I'm, I will meet the latest member of my family next week grandson whose father, who's my son, is half Hungarian and half French, and his mother uh, was born and raised in Brazil of Korean parents. So this multiculturalism will, of course, continue to enrich my own family. But I think it will, beyond that, I think it will be an essential skill to uh, possess as we live in closer and closer proximity with our neighbors. So understanding other cultures, speaking more than one language, uh, I don't even, I don't just mean speaking simply and uh, from your complicated science, but really learning one or two other languages. And of course, traveling to other places, even if it's in the next village, uh, I think is extremely important. Uh, and this is, I, mean, I, I am very lucky because my mother tongue is so complicated that I had to learn other languages. But even if I speak a language not as well as, not as fluently as I speak uh, English or French or Spanish, let's say. The fact that I've made an effort it really opens people's hearts and minds. So I think that's very important. And then I think, of course, leaders have to be close to their communities and not set themselves apart. I think the leader is a servant of the community and not the other way around. In my own experience, it's been amazing how often when I've been in leadership positions, People around me from all cultures seemed really surprised that I would participate in group activities, that I would sit down at a cafeteria table with my staff, wherever there was a, a, a free seat. And then people would say to me, you've been so approachable, which to me seems kind of obvious. But apparently 
the leadership model that people have in their minds is that the leader sits alone wearing a dark suit and thinking great thoughts, but on, on his or her own, usually his. So those are the kinds of things that I think are important. And I mean, I have to say one more thing, and, and that's in the title of solutions. You know, the leaders have got to come up with solutions and have to propose a way forward because it would be too easy to be depressed and we don't want to do that. Well, as the, a global citizen yourself, that is some great advice for our students. So travel more, cultural sensitivity, systems thinking, and just be better communicators overall. I think it's all very good advice. And don't think about yourself so much about how important you are. It's not it shouldn't be an ego trip being a leader in a leadership position. You're serving the community. You've decided that that's what you wanted to do. Then just do it. And it's you have to have thick skin. It's difficult, but it's well worth it. Wonderful. All right. So we're going to change gears a little bit here um, and go kind of back to a bit more of the technical conversation. Um, but we got a question here about uh, measurement and indicators. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Today, there's an increasing trend towards measuring success and evaluating um, specifically on environmental activities um, and mm -hmm. conservation. So somebody asked, what was the role of the IUCN in trying to build the right indicators or measurement tools for conservation and assessing success? Um, so species saved and other you know, indicators. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, unfortunately, many of our indicators were kind of kind of depressing because we were losing species faster but what we uh, and i really pushed for this i was the solution oriented person there as it tell the good stories show that when good conservation is taking place things can be changed and success and and the numbers can grow in in species and so on and somehow or other the environmental community was prone to telling the gloom and doom story and if we want indicators that give hope and that give examples of what other people can do, we need to look for those good stories. Of course, of course, look at them very carefully and very scientifically, but when we tell the story, tell people what they can do to replicate and to scale up. So very important, but it's very important that indicators are not so complicated that people just get di discouraged and don't try to replicate. But we kept on looking for the success stories. And, and the overall picture in terms of species loss, you know, the sixth extinction and so on, it's very, very depressing. But instead of, instead of giving into our depression, I think we just need to continue to look for the successes. And there are some. Great. And, and what role do you think innovation and technology um, is now playing in this measuring capacity, but also just generally in sustainable development? Yeah, well, obviously, first of all, I really, I guess I wouldn't even be speaking with you if I didn't think that the hu human beings are capable of innovating. You know, we did bring, build amazing cathedrals. We went to the moon. We've also done through innovation some pr pretty awful, awful things. However, if we look at the glass half full, we are capable. And, and I think we just have to keep trying. Our education system has to continue to uh, support uh, technological and human innovation. So technologically, obviously, I think one of the greatest challenges is to get off this, this addiction to an energy source, which when we've discovered it, we didn't know. But now that we know that it does cause harm uh, to our planet and uh, certainly to sustainability in terms of climate change. So let's let's encourage the innovations in renewable te renewable energies. And I have no doubt that we can do it. It's, we're already making a lot of progress on that. Let's continue to encourage that. Let's continue to encourage the innovation in how to feed everyone in the world in a in a in a sustainable manner so an agricultural innovation also very important but i also think that we need to focus on innovation we don't usually use that term when we talk about human behavior but how do we as human beings some of us who live in parts of the world where we are consuming way too much I, you probably know that today is earth overshoot day and um, 
And so how can we change our lifestyles, not by being less comfortable, but simply by, by changing and living it differently? I think that is probably the biggest innovation we need to do. Because, you know, I used to tell my colleagues at IUCN, don't tell people when they don't know about IUCN, when you explain what is it that you do, I'm in the business of saving the planet. The planet would be just fine without us. So we need to change things up here. And that's innovation too. So th that's actually a perfect segue into a question we got from Sam. Um, so he's asking specifically about waste. Um, so obviously there's limitation in our infrastructure and in our regulation. But he asked, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of roadmap do you see for us coping with, um, you know, the environmental, uh, the, the environmental damage created by all of our consumption and waste? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think I see. Sam, I saw Sam's question for a minute. I think unless we have appropriate legal a legal framework for people to obey. Uh, we're not going to get very far. I mean, I think it's wonderful if more and more human beings understand that they have to change and want to do the right thing. But we need the legal framework to do it. We need the recycling systems close by in a way that's, that's, that's innovation, in a way where it's not only a nice thing to do, but it's relatively easy to, and, and to consume less. And, and there should be a legal framework about packaging. Why do we need to unwrap and unwrap and unwrap things and throw that wrapping away when we when we find the middle of the box of whatever we've ordered. There's got to be innovation in both technological innovation and legal frameworks and frankly punishment. You know, I, I, I have a house here on, on Lake Geneva, what what the English speak speakers call Lake Geneva. It's really called Lac Léman. And uh, in the 1960s, I think, um, France and Switzerland got together and it must have not have been easy, two countries, and they decided to talk about this lake which was fairly polluted. And they got together and set up the technological method of cleaning it and also the legal method. And now it's a really, really clean lake. And of course the win-win is that there are a lot of tourists, the people are coming here to enjoy nature and to spend money here and so on. So there are ways of doing it, but it, it was a lot of work. I looked into the way they did this. It was a lot of work, both technologically and in terms of human uh, negotiations and, and the framework. So you mentioned um, a legal framework. Um, I know that climate change may not be your area of specific focus, well, but the, the mm -hmm. Paris Climate Agreement is obviously one of the bigger frameworks that's in the news these days. Do you want to just give some general thoughts about that? Sure. And yeah. And first of all, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll argue with you a little bit about climate change may not be my area. I think in terms of legal frameworks, in 1992, when I was already at the at the Rio conference, three conventions were came out of the conference. And uh, as you know, one on desertification, one on climate, one on biodiversity. I really, and even in those days, uh, many of us argued, why don't we put those together? Or at least uh, they, they all, they're terribly related. Uh, but of course, in our silo mentality, we wanted to have three different places, three different teams and so on. Uh, conservation or nature has a lot to do with both mitigation and adaptation. So those issues are very close and I, IUCN worked very hard on and, and I think it's, it's, it's con I know it's continuing to do that to show the links between those, those, those issues. Uh, I think of course probably with a planet of seven and a half billion people and growing and way too many people affected by climate change you know, even I am here, it's quite hot in Europe this summer and we don't have air conditioning and I hope we uh, we don't need to have air conditioning. We just have to open windows. At least we can do that here. But I think, uh, I think, uh, I do think that those conventions should, should have more teeth. And I know the political reasons why it wasn't possible to come up with anything but an agreement. And basically it's a, what used to be called a gentleman's, let's say a gentle person's agreement. Uh, uh, hopefully 99.9% .9 of the countries in the world will stick to what they promised. 
Don't forget, coming back to what I said about leadership, a lot of the people who were in Paris in December 2015 may, may have other jobs or have retired. Uh, what we need to make sure that those long-term promises, not even so long, but still are kept. So I think it, it, it would be wonderful, and my students and I talked about that, how can you put a few more teeth on these kinds of agreements? Because now this is not just about having a wonderful two weeks in Paris. It's really the future of, of, of humanity, of our planet. Uh, great. So um, since you're now, you know, really working very intimately with your students, just wondering if you're seeing any trends in your students and the upcoming generation of practitioners um, that maybe gives us hope to this big culture shift that we maybe need yeah. to live more sustainably. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I have to say that everybody knows Yale is a very special place. There are a handful of these universities where it's very lucky for students to get there um, and they're well supported. I think the trend that I see is that even among the ones who are doing PhDs, but the master's students really want to be to be able to understand different disciplines, understand that they need the system view and want to be in situations where they can start to see the influencing that they can do based on their knowledge. So that, that is really a, a big trend, I think. And ideally, actually, coming back to the legal framework, I would, some of them are doing it, but not too many. Take some courses in the law school as well, which is at a different part of the campus. It's a very famous law school, as you probably know. Um, and some of them find the time to take a few courses. But I think for all of us in these positions, having understanding of the legal, the legal considerations and how to put teeth on these things is, is important. Huge interest in policy influencing. Um, so you had mentioned earlier that you've kind of, you've been in, in the uh, field of sustainable development for a long time, even when we were just defining what that term actually even means. Um, so could you maybe tell our listeners uh, about either your personal or professional experiences that led you to the field of sustainable development? Yeah, I'd be glad to. I, um, I actually started out my international career working for the United Nations Environment Program on Environmental Education. I had this interdisciplinary background in environmental planning and environmental studies quite early before it became sort of respectable to have an interdisciplinary degree. And, um, and I, for me, being in the UN system, perhaps I was too young and too ambitious to, it was just too bureaucratic, frankly, for me. And so I was very lucky that I had that experience and I worked with the UN all my life, but from the outside. And I, I had this job at the International Council for Science, ICSU, whose, whose um, vision is uh, scientific cooperation for the benefit of humanity. And by miracle, as I was hired by that Nobel Prize winner who really didn't quite understand this interdisciplinary degree, um, but he was obviously very brilliant and interested in looking into new things. While I was there, and, as, and then I became the head of that organization, I, um, I, I very much encouraged the scientists to work on, on Earth system work and hope, hoping to also include the human dimension. Uh, that's only really happening now. But in 1990, Maurice Strong, who was a secretary general of the UN conference in Rio, the Earth Summit, who had already been the secretary general of the first uh, uh, conference on the human environment in 1972 in Stockholm. So really a, a leader, a Canadian leader who passed away in 2015, just before the climate conference. He came to me because he saw my interest in these things and asked whether ICSU, the International Council for Science, would be the scientific advisor to the Rio process. I thought it was very courageous of him and I should have put the word courage in my leadership um, training cap capacity building list. Um, he was very courageous to go out of the UN system to ask a bunch of uh, you know, scientists, NGOs, to come and help him define the scientist's responsibility. And that was really the way I became very passionately involved. And, and um, and so it's been, I've been working on those issues ever, ever since. But I, I guess just like those Yale students looking for people to advise them, I, I don't really like the term mentor because I think that puts 
someone like me into an important position. But let's say, I think every all these younger people do need mentors, older people. And Maurice Strong was one of those who gave the International Council for Science and me the chance to show what we could do. And the International Council for Science has been involved in this ever since. And then it was it was then I followed and I became the head of the Leadership for Environment and Development program, the LEAD program, which is training uh, uh, mid-career individuals from different sectors of society so I could really walk the talk in my interest in sustainability and in leadership. And then and then, then I went on to become the head of the, the UN affiliated University for Peace. And the reason I did that, that's in Costa Rica, which certainly walks the talk about sustainability. Um, I, the reason I did that is coming back to how we started the siloed world we live in. I realized that those of us deeply in, involved in the sustainable development world had no contact with the peace and security community. And uh, and so b being at this university, that's what I learned and I and I did. And we, we started a new master's program, which is going on now in environmental security. So these communities have got to talk to each other. It's so, you know, in the sustainable development community, we thought about getting water in a village, but we didn't building a well. But we didn't really have the capacity in those days to think about the safety of the woman who had to walk from kilometers at a time to go pick up that water so these so that's why I did that and then IUCN is obvious why I accepted that position all very impressive and, and quite an inspiration as far as uh, for our gender specifically uh, to see a, such an impressive woman out there doing great things um, so we yeah, have you know I mean lots of people ask me about that I don't I, I, I yeah I think it was probably it wasn't so difficult to do it as a woman. I think many more women could do it. Good to hear. Um, so we have a question specifically about girls and women in developing countries, and if you have any specific advice for them on how to take um, a lead in sustainable forestry specifically, that being a very important issue. Well, I mean, it's it's tough to get 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 oneself accepted by one's peers. It's it, the reality is that it is tougher in some cultures still for young women to be accepted. But I would just try. I would advise women in any field, sustainable forestry and any field, frankly, to not go in to a a, a multi gender group or a, a male group, which is where ma what many groups are still in decision making in, in some countries, not go in with a huge chip on our shoulders about the way women have been treated for centuries. That we cannot change, unfortunately. And so that anger is not going to get us anywhere. Go in with our talent, with our, our good, clear voice. And instead of spending our energies on being angry, spend energies on showing our talents and showing the different way we may understand a problem. So in the sustainable forestry world, we've got to talk to, about and with the communities that live near and in and from the forest. And many women know how to do that better, frankly. So just go for it uh, in a positive way. And if you, need to, if you need to complain a little bit, do so in private with your friends, but I would I would just use great female talent to solve problems, listen to others, use those leadership skills. Um, and, and in a related question too, are there any uh, specific books or documentaries that you would recommend to our listeners on you know understanding the sustainable development, conservation, uh, these these topics that we've covered? In more detail, gosh, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna answer you because there are so many. My whole library is full of them. I'm not sure that they're any specific, and it does depend an awful lot on 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 um, the the issue and on the culture. Uh, I I don't know if hmm, let me think. Uh, you know what? I'll write to you about this. I'm just looking at this wonderful book called Biophilic Design, which I really liked. I always liked uh, books about urban planning because there's well, the design of cities by Bacon, I really love because it talks about nature too. After all, you know, 75% of us are going to be living in cities. It's very important. So I'd be glad to 
submit a, a bibliography, but I don't have one. I love the stuff that the SDSN puts out, frankly. Thank you. And, and to our listeners, too, if we do hear from Julia later with any recommendations, we'll make sure to post those on our Facebook yeah. page so you can all see them. Maybe um, you, could, uh, you could think about asking me a specific question in what area. And, but I'll be glad to send you a, a list of my favorite books. That, that would be great. And we'll share those with everyone. Okay. Um, um, about what people can do, what the general public can do. Um, mm -hmm. So someone is concerned about, or sorry, Christesri, um, wildlife crime and trophy hunting specifically. Um, do you, are there any measures that people can take uh, to be aware of uh, to not trade in goods and services that are provided by species that are endangered or critically endangered as per IUCN yes. list? Yeah, yeah, no, this is a very good question. This is a huge problem. Again, there are some good stories. Again, when there is a, a, a well-trained legal framework, uh, then, then, then uh, the poaching and the trophy hunting doesn't happen. And of course, so I think what we need to do is really ask questions. There are certain certain species that we know are in danger. Look at the red list, first of all. And then if you think you're buying something that has ivory or, or for heaven's sakes, uh, you know, rhino horn on it, call the police. <laughs> you know, d it, this is now an emergency. I think that we here is where we really have to go to our legal frameworks and to make sure that we that they have the teeth. I would recommend to the person who just asked the question to check on the website of CITES, which is the UN Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, actually set up by IUCN many years ago, and that they are working very well. Actually, the head of CITES, who used to work for IUCN at one point, has, has um, a partnership with the international police, Interpol, so these are serious issues that shouldn't only be discussed at this point just by scientists who love their elephants. We have to make sure that we have we have a way of protecting protecting the wildlife. And so much of that is linked to ending poverty. Why do we think people are killing elephants? Because they're poor. And and if this is the only way that they can feed their families, well, I'm not so sure, you know. I'm not sure what I would do, but we, what we have to do is go to the root of the matter. So uh, do you have any advice for us, maybe speaking with, uh, you know, not necessarily sustainable development practitioners, but, you know, our family and friends who are, are less educated on, you know, the, the crises and the extinction that is yeah. happening right now. But how do we encourage yes. people to care more, to take action, to have this thought process when they are buying different products and you know sourcing from specific companies? Any advice on how we you know educate our family members, loved ones, and friends? Well, I mean, I certainly would talk about these issues. Make sure we talk about the issues in very simple, user-friendly language, and tell the good stories. And there are good stories when action, because there are too many people who say, "I'm just a small part of the problem. I can't do anything." Of course, if seven billion of us would do the right thing, everything would change. And even if you know three billion of us would do the right thing, things would change. So it, the responsibility starts here. So tell. Tell the stories, get them in, in, interested. There are some beautiful movies out there about about these things that people don't like to read. Uh, and 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 then I think what we need to do is really we need to get our act together uh, in in the certification systems. There are too many of them. There are several that certify for us. For example, I think that it's all wonderful, but there are too many of them. So that the consumer is not so confused as to which, what to buy. But I do think, you know, I have a, I have a, a green a bio store here nearby. And two years ago, it was empty. It's a little bit more expensive. Nowadays, it's full and full of people. So people are getting it that they're buying local. There are no plastic bags in that shop. You have to bring your own or just take your tomatoes home with you in your hand. Um, so, you know, I'm starting to be also kind of cool to be like that. I remember when I first started to take, you know, canvas bags to the supermarket and people looked at me as if something was wrong. Poor woman, you know, 
she has to wear, I don't know, she has to carry canvas bags. But nowadays, in many countries, uh, here where I am in France, you have to pay for the plastic bag. So people are starting to do it. Just we, we have to make it not only important but fun and cool and, and that everybody should do it. I was the first director general of IUCN who rode my bicycle to my office. Not that that was such a big deal. It was a very safe place to ride a bicycle. But And then people started to say, oh, well, if she's doing it. Uh, that's, that's very inspirational and a lot of very good advice there. Um, so kind of going back to our conversation we we're having about, you know, the next generation of leaders. And uh, you had mentioned your own experience of, you know, confronting the bureaucratic system of the United Nations and, you know, entering that as a young, inspired and mm -hmm. excited person. But then obviously seeing that there's a lot of red tape out there, our political systems are complicated and this growing world of globaliza globalization and global citizens, you know, yeah. it seems like it's even harder and harder to make change and move things forward. Um, do you have any words of inspiration for those young professionals, you know, who are about to work, enter the workforce or maybe are about to do a career shift um, and move into this field? Well, I mean, I think I think uh, people just really need to know in what kind of organization they're getting into or they want to get into. So the United Nations indeed has an awful lot of processes and uh, and doesn't necessarily apparently treat young people all that well. I wasn't treated that well. Well, but I was very young and, and perhaps too idealistic and wanted to change things quickly. And I didn't quite understand these layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy, frankly. Uh, so I think I was, um, I look back on that decision to leave and I'm very proud of myself because it wasn't so easy to leave a well-paying tax-free job, but I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, I probably didn't quite understand the culture before I went in there. I just thought, you know, as I said before, great objectives, great idea. Of course, it's going to be great. And it is great, but um, not for everyone. So understand the culture of the place you're going to go into first and to make sure that you can feel comfortable in that culture. And then every single culture needs a little gentle change. But do it gently. I did not uh, get up and scream about how... I thought things were not so helpful to a young person. And it's only now in my book that I write about it a little bit because it, it was a long time ago. And, but it wasn't going to get me anywhere. And it turned out that I became, you know, the colleague of a lot of those people as, they, as I became the head a few years later of a big uh, international NGO. So it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have helped to scream. Had there been more people like me, Inside, I probably would have stayed and we would have tried gently to change things. That was some years ago now, and I'm not sure we would have so much time to gently change things. So I guess my best advice is be very realistic about the organization you're going to work for before you accept a job. And I realize that jobs are not that easy to find. But before you accept a job, really ask questions about the culture and how you're going to and the leadership and how you're going to be received and how you're going to feel. That is as important as the great objective and the vision. So yeah, do, doing your research and knowing where you're applying to, why you're applying there, making sure that yeah. you know it's the right fit for you rather than just, just the United Nations or other. Exactly. You know, when, whenever I interviewed anybody for IUCN, I not only interviewed them on their technical know-how, and by the time the shortlisted candidates came to me as a director general, they were all technically pretty, very good. But how were they going to fit in culturally? How was their how was their communication skills? How did they feel about the kind of work, traveling, and so on? Yeah, the kind of work that we do, and would they feel comfortable? Because a person who doesn't feel comfortable can cause a lot of harm, not only to herself or himself, but to the colleagues. So maybe, Julia, maybe you could say a little bit more specifically in that role for the IUCN or thinking of other, you know, big conservation organizations. What skills were you looking for exactly? Technical, or you mentioned obviously communication and interpersonal, yeah. um, but maybe specifically what technical well, would you? Well, so IUCN has a very specific role in the world. It is really a union. The U in the name, I, I would say, is the most important. Uh, it is a union of over a thousand NGOs, big and small, 
any NGO that you would know, whose acronym you would know, WWF, which actually was created by IUCN in the 1960s, the Nature Conservancy and so on. I mean, a thousand of them. And, and then almost every government in the world, very interesting architecture, by the way, and quite, quite unusual and quite a brave design in 1948. Everybody talks about multi-stakeholder uh, communication, then IUCN is actually walking the talk on that. So, uh, so IUCN was different. So because it is a union and is supposed to enable its members to do the right thing on the ground, and together more of them would do, one, one, we, uh, the organization could do more with if all the members um, were, were pulling in the same direction. That's, of course, a dream. So I was all, not only looking for the technical people, people who understood species, who understood protected areas, understood environmental law, understood communication, but I was also looking for people who could build that union, who could strengthen that union, bringing people together, uh, negotiating with different cultures to come, come out with a, a shared position. Pretty complicated stuff. And not everyone who studied, you know, who might have had a PhD in in, in um, nature conservation or about butterflies would, would know how to do that. So I was looking for those additional skills. But we had gr a great staff, so we found those people. We had over a thousand great people. Uh, were there any like specific organizations that you looked for for them to be associated with, or you know, uh, newsletters, or you know, things, you know? Things that they had done before, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, of course, always the big, the big challenge for people coming straight out of university or graduate school. And then people always ask, well, what was your previous experience? And, um, and, and it's not always so easy to get previous experience if you've been studying all the time. So I actually, in, in the case of IUCN, I was interested in people who had... Uh, not only studied, but who had done internships at least, or summer work, or or, or volunteer work, so that they had a multifaceted experience. Because the issues we were dealing with, both in terms of the the scientific and technical issues and the multicultural issues, getting this whole union to work effectively, needed that kind of experience. So I think I would certainly recommend people who are in the early part of their career to gather this kind of experience, even if it doesn't pay well, uh, because it's very good for your CV. I also have to say that I also recommend to people my age not to stay in their professional positions or in the same place for too long. You, it, I, I mean, I have been so enriched by the different things that I managed to do. I, I always stayed long enough, I think, to hopefully make a positive difference, but it, you don't want somebody to stay around in, 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 even in a leadership position for too long. I think it's very healthy to move on and you build on the experience. Wonderful, I think that's really helpful to our listeners. Um, so Julia, I'm gonna ask you one more question from our audience here and then maybe we'll just do some final thoughts and wrap up okay. at the end of our hour. Um, so this is going back more to the technical side again um, and asking a question about emissions targets. Um, mm -hmm. So specifically the developing countries and the capacity of developed countries to help them meet those emission targets um, and transfer clean tech and renewables to developing countries. Um, how likely do you see this succeeding uh, based on your experiences? Well, I'm going to stay an optimist. Things that are not... Yeah, the, the decision by the United States was extremely depressing. Um, but again, I, de I guess I decided not to stay in bed all day and cry over it. But we have to, we have to stay optimistic. In some ways, Europe, where I live now, I think is saying, "Well, we can do it. We will do it." Uh, too bad that our 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 colleagues in the United States, for the moment, anyway. Although. We also know that in the United States, some states are doing better than every than than countries. So, I think California has just been documented as having a really good result. So, I think both in emission targets, where uh, uh, the the so-called developed world has got to do a lot because it has a technological way of cutting down from burning carbon, and the so-called developing world. I don't like those. Terms. So that's why I'm calling it so-called, because we've got an awful lot of 
underdeveloped aspects of the so-called developed world. You probably see some homeless people right outside your door in New York, for example. You know, so there's a lot, a lot of problems everywhere. Um, but I think that the the parts of the world which have had te the privileged technological um, background and achievements have an obligation to help the others. And and we all live in this one tiny planet, which and it's it's a spaceship Earth. And just because I live in a country which has has been fortunate in terms of climate and development doesn't mean that my neighbors shouldn't share. And as again, I come back to our this this human technological innovation that we need to understand that we share this spaceship together, and that there is no way that we should accept that some some parts of our neighborhood are as poor as they are, and some parts are as rich as they are. So that's that's going to be that is the biggest challenge, that human innovation. And and you know the sooner the better in our education system to think not only about yourself but about the other. In investing in that that next generation and making sure they don't make the same mistake. Absolutely, yeah. And then don't even look at it as a mistake because we didn't really know. But now that we know, this is what I think is so is so hard to understand. You know, after 2015, we really knew a lot. And we have the capacity to build on that knowledge and to to change. And it could also be a really a new energy in our world because I think people are a little bit lost looking for something. Let's have that something be the sustainability of our planet. So I feel very good about ending here on a positive note. Um, but Julia, I'll welcome. Are there any final words that you'd like to say to our viewers? Well, I, I wish I could have seen the viewers and I wish I, we could have some personal conversations. Actually, I do think that these webinars are really useful. But I think as, mu as in addition, as much as possible, when people get together physically and they see that there's not so much difference between one human being and another. And I think that, you know, just reaching out to the other in your communities, in your neighborhoods, and if you're lucky enough to do it internationally, uh, I think that's extremely useful and important and not one of us should go to those discussions thinking that we know things much better than the other and that we need to learn from each other. We do have solutions. So let's let's get on and, and live by those. Walk the talk about solutions. And really raise our children and grandchildren, those of us who even have those. As I said, I'll be meeting my new one next week. Let's let's make sure that they they see that there are there are these possibilities. Great, and you used really cool uh, inner internet technology to talk to each other across an ocean. Yeah. And make <laughs> make this whole thing a cool thing to do. Well, I think today was really cool, and I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We'll follow up with you um, and any other questions that we get from our readers, we may send you an email or two. And thank you everybody Very good. that's watching live online. Stay tuned for an announcement for our next Q&A and our next Meet Our Leaders series. Thank you. Bye-bye to all of you. Bye.